Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes. We all fall down. As I carry her one last time to the crematory with the nursery rhyme playing over and over again in my head like a bad mixtape. A few attendants rush to my aid and offer assistance. I wave my head, I wave my hand, sending them away at the same time, sweeping away dark memories that are beginning to transport me to a place I have tried to forget. The clouds of darkness take me to a place to my parents' home. I'm standing in the middle of a room spinning in circles, staring at two lifetimes of memories gathered in the last remaining vessels of my parents' life together. Just a few months prior, I was standing in the same room listening to my daughters and their cousins singing that very nursery rhyme in the adjacent room while mourners had gathered to remember my mother's life, attempting to console my sister and I of her passing. I remember feeling her presence in the room, trying to ease my pain, as she had done so many times in my youth. My mourners have gathered to I didn't cry that time. day. In all honesty, I couldn't remember the last time I did cry. I, her I loved my mother tremendously. Even with the loss of that love, I wouldn't allow myself to grieve the way I needed to, the way I should have. I was an emotional black hole. I could take in everyone's sorrow, everyone's anger. I thought I could take all they could give. Thinking that it was my new mission, I was going to entail how to fight my new, oh crap. That sucked. It was part of my mission. i had been trained to be this way. Don't show emotion. Emotion equals weakness. If you are weak, then their Marines will not follow you. You must be strong. You must be stoic. They can fall, but you must, not, you must be there to pick them up. I took my mother's illness and passing as just another mission, a job that must be accomplished no matter the sacrifice to myself. I received the news that my mother was terminally ill on the other side of the world, in an eight month deployment in, in the middle of an eight in the in eight months into a year long deployment to Afghanistan, a recovery mission after that call, every corpse I saw carried my mother's face. Once my command heard of my mother's diagnosis, my deployment was cut short. On the flight home, I sat alone quietly thinking of what my new mission was going to entail, how to fight my new enemy. I was greeted at the runway with sympathetic hugs and tears from my wife and children, all thankful for my return but heartbroken that it had come to such a cost. The drive home was solemn, my wife updating me on my mother's condition, what to expect when I see her and what to anticipate in the months ahead. The only creature untainted by the weight of the world was my dog, Ginger, who jumped and leaped as I walked through the door, giving me a brief glimmer of joy in my dreary night. The months leading up to my mother's passing were rigorous on everyone. A night, either my wife or I would be at my mother's bedside in Los Angeles two hours away, while the other would be with our children, both a labor of love, but a labor none the same. Trying to explain to our kids why the other wasn't home and that their grandmother was trying to survive. Sitting with my mother without the emotional support of my wife was excruciating. On occasions when we were both to get home together, my thoughts would be someplace else, lost in the past or dwelling on the future. I would walk with Ginger late at night when sleep wouldn't come, which it often did. We wandered the streets for hours in an attempt to quiet my mind and hopefully find my way home. Ginger didn't question. She just walked beside me, keeping me company as I navigated the streets while trying to break through the dark clouds engulfing my mind. At times, she tried to guide me, 
pulling her leash in a direction I wasn't ready to go. She didn't persist. She just kept walking by my side when I went the other way. When we finally walked through the doors, I stood at the threshold of my kids' room, watching them dream, and I would sit at the edge of my bed, <laughs> wanting to wake my wife and tell her all I can confide into the dog, but I didn't have the strength to show her how weak I had become. I eventually laid on the couch in the darkness and Ginger would rest her head on my lap, nudging my hand for me to stroke her. When my mother passed, I was surrounded by family, yet I was all alone. My wife was at our home with our children, ensuring their well-being and quietly comforting them with the loss of their grandmother. The drive home from LA to San Diego by myself took nine hours. Not because of traffic, but because I was fighting an emotional storm and wrestling with the questions of sanity. I would stop at every Vista spot and look out into the darkness across the Pacific thinking, how peaceful the abyss seems. I must be strong for my family. I can't show weakness. We are stronger as a team. We will get through this. My family is my new mission, a new battle to fight. I, I didn't realize then that my mind was becoming my enemy. After my mother's funeral, my sister and I prepared my mother's estate. Sifting through family memories one by one, we selected what would be given to family, what would be sold, what would be donated, and what would be thrown away. We collected documents, closed accounts, fixed and repaired our childhood home for a pending sale. My last night in their home, I spun in circles as a soft light from the TV danced shadows across the remainder of their memories. A place that had once been filled with so much love was being swallowed by clouds of despair. Next to the television was an empty bottle of gin. Alongside that half empty bottle of, was a half empty bottle of orange juice. The contents of both had been combined into a cup destined to be my unholy grill. Dissolving in that concoction are the remnants of the pain medications from my mother's cabinet. Once meant to ease her pain, I pray will do the same for me. As I spun around the room, eyeing the echoes of the past, my mission is over. My family is safe at home. My mother is resting. Her affairs are in order. My enemy is still whispering in my ear. I, I try to summon the courage to end the battle that wages inside. I look around my cocoon one last time as the dawn begins to pierce through the windows. The dust and the light reminds me of the, of the dissolving pills, dancing in my elixir to help ease me into my oblivion. The beams of light slowly rise. I reach my hand out into the light and feel its warmth on my skin. I can almost feel the kisses of my children upon my hand when they hold it to their cheek. As if I can feel the touch of my wife as she reaches out, interlocking her fingers with mine when she knows that the pain is just too great for me to bear alone. My shoulders crumple to my side, the tension in my body retreats and I fall to the floor. Yet still not a tear is shed. After I slowly push myself up, I walk over to the kitchen and pour my poison of pills, gin, and everything into the black abyss. Looking back out into the window as the sun breaks the horizon. When I arrive home, I was greeted with hugs and kisses by my family, thankful for my return. Sitting patiently waiting for her turn is Ginger who greets me once again with leaps of joy and unconditional affection. That night, the two of us walked the streets of suburbia. She listened intently to me speak of what happened the night before, how the pain I carried with me was breaking me from the inside and the cracks were starting to show. Our routine continued over the months. Sometimes we would walk, others 
We would sit on a park bench and she would lay beside me just listening to my troubles. Every time we arrived home, she would lay beside me on the couch with her head on my lap, making sure I was all right. I began to feel at home again. My mind was more at ease and the darkness that clouded my days began to dissipate. When I left for work every morning, Ginger was there to say goodbye with a cuddle of my leg and a lick of my hand. It was late June. My mother had been gone for two months when I received a phone call from my wife that Ginger had become violently ill. I rushed home to find her laying in her vomit on the living room floor. I sped her to the vet's office. She didn't have the strength to walk, so I carried her in my arms. While we waited for the doctor to see her, I just sat next to her. As she laid on the table, my head on her chest. The vet's prognosis was grim. He solemnly told me that she had advanced stages of cancer and that he was amazed that she was still alive. I thought of all the midnight walks she went on with me. She never seemed to mind. She put her pain aside to ease mine. The doctor told me that she didn't have long, that she was in excruciating pain and I should make the decision so she no longer had to suffer. I brought her home one last time, carrying her in my arms. Everybody said their goodbyes. They all hugged Ginger with tears in their eyes. And with each hug, Ginger managed to give them a nuzzle and a lick. I carried her back to the vet's office and held her in my arms as the doctor administered his concoction, and then left us to be alone. As the poison pulsed through her veins, I found myself holding her tighter and tighter, trying to squeeze all the love I could out of her before she was gone forever. As she drew her last breaths, I released my hold on her, nuzzling her neck with my head. When she finally exhaled the remainder of a life, I fell to the floor on the sterile room, cradling Ginger in my arms. I cried like a child not only for Ginger, but for my mother, like Ginger, who loved me unconditionally. I picked Ginger up one last time, the nursery rhyme playing in my head, and carried her to the crematorium. <laughs>